Um, let's start with Sarah. And for anyone who's just joined, thank you for joining. We're going to talk about getting mortgages as a founder now. And we've got uh, Sarah here from Athena to talk to us all about it. Now, Sarah, um, this was a huge topic in Twitter for us um, last week. Um, lots and lots of people had lots of horror stories on um, not being able to get uh, mortgages or having to run through all sorts of difficult hoops with the big four and other uh, lenders. Why don't we start? So why don't we start there? What, what, what is it about being a founder, in particular a startup founder, that makes it challenging to get a mortgage? Um. Let's use the big four as an example and their subsidiaries. I don't even think they would understand a lot of them what, what founders are, what startups are, and even sort of what we talk, you know, everybody that's that's on this call today. What they look at is um, your, your income structure. So when they're considering you as an applicant for a home loan, they look at um, they look at it in sort of three buckets. And in, in the credit world, we call it the three C's of credit. What's your character? So how long have you lived at your address? How long have you been in your job? Um, do you have a good credit history? And then they look at your collateral because clearly they want to take the house and security that you're either looking to purchase or you're looking to refinance. Um, is it a good security? How much equity do you have in that property? And the third one, which is where I guess the founder's challenge comes in, is capacity. So that's your income. Um, how much money do, are you earning to be able to service this debt? And traditionally, with um, anybody that's a director or shareholder of a company, um, even if you're, you're paying yourself a PAYG salary, they will look at you as though you're self-employed. And so then the self-employed rules come into effect. And the way that they look at self-employed, and, and any of you that have been through this, you'll recognise it as I start to talk through it, is they'll say to you, give me your last two years, company financials and personal financials. And that'll include your financial statements from your accountant and your tax returns. And what are they looking for? Well, they're looking for the bottom line. Are you making a profit or is this operating at a loss? Mm. And any loss... And most of these um, founders, some of these, you know, some of these startups might even be two years old. Mm. But if they are, we know purposefully we could be operating at a loss for a perfectly good reason because we keep we keep injecting that revenue back into the business to keep growing it. Yep. Um, they will. They are literally looking at that bottom line to go. There's a loss there. What's what shareholding do you have in the company? And then they will attribute that loss to the shareholding that you have. Got it. So, 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 in that case, that even if you are paying yourself a PAYG salary and you've got you know multiple months of back statements and and, uh, and payroll uh, to suggest you're receiving a good income from yeah. your company, yes. they'll ignore that effectively and look straight through to the company. They'll take that and they'll offset it against the loss that they see in the company. So, um, so they'll look at both things um, and they'll see that through your personal tax return as well. So, they absolutely want probably want to see some pay slips and some bank statements and they'll see that you're paying yourself that regular sort of salary but then they'll also go well, as a shareholder of this company you are liable for any sort of losses that are that are um that are coming from this company and then they'll offset that salary with those losses right which is where the challenge comes in and do they do they do, how, how deeply do they think about the different types of companies? Do they do they care, for example, about the differences between a startup who might be receiving outside funding from a venture capitalist or otherwise and burning cash deliberately, so, or versus a you know a cafe who um, mm. is having to still making a loss but may not be um, supported externally? So say in in the case where you walk into a to a big four branch. Um, they're not going to look at you too differently from the cafe down the road. They have a policy and they will apply it. And they don't really have that much discretion to sort of wave one way or the other from that policy. Um, if you were to go for a broke, you know, clearly I'm a big supporter and proponent of brokers, given that this is sort of where the space that I'm working in. Um, you go to a broker, they can start to look at things differently and start to look at your own individual situation, have that conversation with you and think about how they can, or one, which lender do I think would look at this in a different light mm -hmm. um, and also really start to understand your own personal situation because in reality, every 
every one of us, our situation is, is very different. Um, but unfortunately, in, in certain lenders, it is very much, this is the box, this is the box I can sort of work within, mm -hmm. and they can't necessarily think too much outside of that box, which I think is where mortgage brokers really um, sort of come into play and where where um, I'm, I'm a big supporter. The other, the other side is also private banking. Mm. So, um, again, set up a little bit differently, have, have greater experience and more understanding of individual sort of circumstances, but they're also able to look at those things outside of the square. They can start to take into consideration the balance sheet, yep. which is the capital that's, that, that these companies are having injected into them, what the assets look like, whereas just if you're walking in as a customer off the street to a branch or, um, or the like, they very much are only looking at that profit and loss statement. Does, does it matter if you uh, your company is banking with that same bank? Does that help you or does that help you or does it make, not make a difference? Um, look, you've probably all sort of seen in the news if you pay too much attention to you know, responsible lending legislation that's... Um, up for um, big discussions at the moment and they're looking at repealing that um, and so on. And a lot of this really does come back to what you can and can't do within those laws. Mm. Um, and so whilst it's, you know, when I talk about those three Cs, that's the character component. Like you've got a long running history with this lender, with yep. this bank, you know, you've got cash with this bank and they will absolutely look at that and take that into consideration when they are looking at the application. But unfortunately, they do need to look at all three. And being that, being that you, said, you mentioned um, the, the trigger is being a shareholder or a director in the company mm. and, and there's a lot of um, a lot of founders here. There are probably also a lot of uh, employees mm. that are, shareholders in their companies does this affect them in the same way if they have ESOPs or their early shareholders in their companies no it's it's the combination of the two so just as a shareholder like a lot of us may have shareholdings in the company that we're working for we may hold shares elsewhere and you know publicly listed companies <laughs> that's when you start to go well that could be additional income you could be deriving dividends from that you could have sold some shares and made some money that stuff that actually can you can start to go, well, I've got additional income. But for the poor director, the poor founder, yep. it's the two, the combination of the two that really and that's, does and, change. And they know that because you're a director and a shareholder. A director that's and a, a shareholder, of combination of those two things. They'll run your credit check and they'll see that within your credit check that you are a director of that company. And got that's it. where the questions all start. Got yeah. it. Okay, okay. Um, uh, and then um, is, is there any, do you have any sort of, if, if, if you've got founders out there on the in the room here that are probably thinking about starting off on their journey towards getting a mortgage, mm -hmm. um, is there anything that they can do in the lead up to that to try and optimise their chances of getting a mortgage when they come to it? Look, um, I would say, I mean, there's lots of things that anybody can do. The things that people... Uh, sort of get frustrated with is how much now there's almost forensic accounting and how um, lenders look at your bank statements and your expenses and any other sort of personal liabilities you might have like credit card debt and, and personal loans and the like. Mm. Any lender, any any borrower you would say within that sort of three months where you're thinking of going to speak to somebody, you know, cut back on the coffees, yep. uh, cut back the expenses because these lenders will potentially go line by line through your statements and ask lots of questions about those expenses, mm. um, reduce that, that unsecured liability to, you know, optimise the amount of, of money that you can borrow. Those are those are just tips for anybody looking to yep, go have that general, conversation. But what I would say particularly for founders is as early as possible, start that conversation if you are going to speak to a broker or you are going to speak to a private banker don't leave it to the point where you're like oh i'm ready now to get the loan in place mm. i would do it long before in that sort of contemplation sort of phase have that conversation so you know what you're up for there's no surprises and, and, and one thing i always noticed when i was living in the states is that everybody knows their credit score within yes. the nth degree and they obsess over it yeah. um, it's probably it's less so in australia people don't know it off the back of their hand they don't have it tattooed anyway. yeah. <laughs> um, 
I'm going to give a shout out here to, to a startup. I don't know if um, Dan, um, the, the CEO of We Money, may well be in the room here. He's obsessed with this sort of stuff, so it wouldn't surprise me. Um, but they've got a fantastic app. If you want to check your credit score and you want to do it for free, um, uh, join up with We Money. It's a great app, personal finance management app, but it also has free credit scores attached to it. So go check it out. Well worth it. Um, but, but is there anything you can do if, if you have? Um, you know, a lot of founders out there will have, you know, taken out credit cards to get their company to start and have done sort of, we've gone for long periods without salary in some cases. Mm. So may have um, some challenges around their credit score. What are some good ways to sort of start improving that as they start to think about getting a mortgage down the track? Um, yeah, and in as much as we know in the US, it was a big thing is definitely becoming a far bigger thing here in Australia with the introduction of comprehensive credit reporting where literally the lender can see all of your debts, all of your... Um, you talk, I know there's a difference between positive credit reporting and negative credit that's reporting. That's right. Talk us through what that means yeah. for people. So, you know, prior to positive reporting being introduced, which is similar to, I guess, to what the US has, um, negative reporting literally just sort of gave the lender the history of, say, inquiries you had had with telcos and um, home loan providers, you know, with finance providers. So you'd, you'd be able to see, oh, okay, look, this person's gone and applied for a couple of credit cards in the last six months. You wouldn't see any information about whether that debt was open, closed, current, what was owing, what was the repayment history. So that's what's sort of called negative reporting. You'd literally only see, would see that they inquired to mm -hmm. or applied for, you know, finance. What the positive reporting shows you is that credit score, which takes all of, you know, takes those inquiries into consideration, as well as 18 months worth of repayment history right. um, on the debts that you hold. So you'll see the balances, you'll see when that um, debt was opened, yep. you'll see it if it was closed. So does that mean it's like in the stage you can repay it, you, you can take out a credit card? Um, run it and repay it every month and yep. every repayment goes to improving your credit yes, score? Yes, 100%. Right. So um, paying on time, clearly super important. You are given a little bit of leeway there. The, the lenders don't report until you're 45 days sort of overdue. So, you know, don't freak out if you're like, oh, I forgot, the, forgot to pay the credit card repayment two days ago. Yep. That's not going to affect you. Yep. But if you're sort of... 15 days over it, it is gonna it is gonna um show up there as as a missed repayment on, against you and the same thing applies to anyone who's recently um come to, to come to australia and is building up a credit file i remember when i had to do that in um uh, the u.s mm. I, you know, it was, they gave me they wouldn't give me a uh, i had no credit history so they gave me the most baby or baby credit i don't yeah. think i had like a Two hundred dollar limit on it, or something. Yeah. But it was just a case of sort of putting something on it every month, paying it back, even just putting like a, a small meal or something, and just that act of repaying it. Um, Hundred percent. So you've got two ends of the spectrum. You've got people that probably you know love to chase the points on the credit cards and don't realise that that can have a negative effect on their on their credit score and and. Um, you know, you're like, well, I just want the Qantas points. I'm not great in this day and age, but, you know, great in the past and will be again in the future. And, that, and you don't understand that impact. Then you'll have the people that are like, oh, I absolutely never apply for anything. I don't, you know, I hate credit cards. Um, and 100% you'll show up as someone, well, you've got no credit history. You've got no repayment history. So you kind of want to be a person somewhere in the middle of that. And then probably the people with the really you know, high scores yep. show up as it from that character side again that I speak about is somebody that's that's going to be um, potentially a good person to lend money that's, to. That's awesome. Um, and and, and now I, I, sort of other tips and tricks on how to um, best improve your chances of getting more. We don't, don't want to um, uh, get you to say anything that might get you in trouble, <laughs> but is there anything around um, sort of structuring your ownership in the company, putting it in a family trust or your, your spouse if you have one? Uh, someone you trust um, that, that, that can help um, with the situation? Yeah, look, um, you know, I probably can't give that advice, but, <laughs> and I'm sure somebody else could, but those things clearly are going to help. Yep. Um, if, if literally you've got a credit assessor sitting there looking at your situation, they're looking at your credit file, and you have hold that directorship in your name, mm -hmm. then... They are literally just going to look at it from that perspective. Yep. If it's if it's structured differently, um, then they'll look at it differently. It's Got sort it. of as simple as that. Um, I would say, you know, we've seen ones where I think 
we've had um, customers that have clearly had good advice to sort of set it up that way, but always if, if the trail can sort of lead its way back to you, then eventually, you know, they, they will still be like, well, you're the beneficiary or whatever of that trust, so inevitably you're still liable. Yep. So you've, you know, yeah. so make sure you've got a good and account I, in that house. And I, I, should those have, things. I, should have, I should have put it up right at the top of this. None of what we say here is in any way financial <laughs> advice. Um, and uh, please don't uh, take it as that. Um, but um, it's uh, it's more uh, interesting to this. Um, uh, Okay, no, that's really helpful. And, and so, and then through tax a little bit, because this is sort of your bread and butter, is yeah. figuring out a home for every loan. Mm -hmm. If 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 you had Athena had someone who came and said, "Hey, I'm a founder. I own seventy percent of my business. It's a SaaS company. We have great prospects, and we're backed by Airtree and got lots of money, but we're not making any money. We're we're burning money. And the company's in my name. I'm a director. All the big four told me to bugger off. Um, where where would you sort of suggest I I went to? Yeah, and there are people starting to catch up, you know, with this decade and century. So um, there are lenders out there, and they're not the big four, unless it's these private banking types that I spoke about, um, that are starting to understand that this is sort of a niche, um, you know, area that we we need to we need to be aware of. So um, there are lenders out there. I don't want anybody to think, oh well, you know, I'm doing. There's nobody out there that's going to even consider me for a mortgage until my company's making a profit. Um, there's a couple, like I'll throw a, a few names out there, Red Z, um, Break Money, Pepper Money. Now, people will say Pepper, aren't they? People that just help people with bad credit, and, you know, and, and they absolutely do do that. Um, but they also um, they also are self-employed specialists that can look at these things, look at your balance sheet, look at... Um, look at you as the, the startup and what your future earning potential is versus the historical, which is all the, the big four and sort of the lenders we'd all, you know, be aware of out there um, can consider. Yep. So um, now I guess the, the catch is they mightn't be able to give you interest rates like the big four. You know, you might yep. be looking at fixed rates with ones in front of them and variable rates with twos, but they're not – these aren't shockingly – Terrible rates. We're talking we talking threes, talking? fours, fives, depending on the risk. So they so will cash They will risk base price. Yeah. So. Um, and is it, is, will they have a different LVR? Um, absolutely, what they'll is, be looking at a lower sort of LVR. So depending. What is it, LVR for a, uh, yeah. So a LVR is your loan to value ratio. So it's literally how much do I want to want to borrow? So your loan amount divided by the value of your security. So when you hear bankers and credit assessors and brokers talking out the R. It's literally a very simple calculation, loan amount divided by security value, so the, the value of your house. Um, I've got a couple of questions here, and, and I should say welcome to everybody who's on Zoom. Mel mm -hmm. has done a terrific job of hacking. I have no idea how she's doing this, but we're somehow being presented on Zoom as well as Clubhouse here, which is, I'm sure is in breach of some of Clubhouse <laughs> and or Zoom's um, terms and conditions, but, but welcome to everyone there. Um, uh, I've got a question uh, coming from Shubi. Can the business loss be mitigated through a guarantor? Is that is that an option? Guarantors generally aren't there to offset, say, serviceability um, challenges. You usually use a guarantor because you you don't have enough deposit or um, you want to lower the LVR that I just spoke about so you don't have to pay lenders mortgage insurance, for example. Mm. Um, unless you're sort of setting it up in a different structure where you might be borrowing under a company, which you can do on residential side as well, then clearly you would need personal guarantees um, based on that company. But if you were just borrowing in your own name and looking to add a guarantor for serviceability um, purposes, yep. um, there's not that many sort of prime lenders out there that would look at that situation. Yep. Um, they'd probably ask them to be a borrower on the loan, not okay. a guarantor. And then and what about if the business is, this is from, from Mitch, can I Mitch, um, down in uh, Canberra, or he's usually up in Sydney these days. Um, what is, uh, what about a cash flow positive business? Does that change things? If you're making money? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Everybody wants to know when you're making money. Um, and and equally, like, we're just talking zero, you know, plus. Like, yeah. they're not going to be. As long as you're breaking as even. As long as you're breaking even, the loss does away. not get offset. Okay. okay. And then another, another, um, uh, thing that, that often comes up for, for founders um, is that they may not be able to uh, have as large a servicing component, but sometimes 
um, you're able to take money off the table as a secondary um, sale along the way as part of your fundraising. And, and, mm. um, uh, and this is something that we do a lot with our founders is, um, you know, we are very happy to give them a, when we do a fundraise or we do a follow on fundraise, very happy to give the founders some money off the table so they can go and do things like either pay off their mortgage or get a mortgage. Mm. Because, like, does that, does it make a difference if you're bringing with a sort of a larger deposit because you've cashed out some of your shares? Um, yeah. Does that offset some of the issues that yeah. founders have? So that's the whole um, sort of, I guess, collateral piece. So the lower that, that loan to value ratio is, the less risk perceived by the by the lender yep. so you're still going to have issues with these prime lenders you're still going to have issues you know they're, they're very black and white in relation to the to the income side of things mm. but with these lenders that are starting to understand this this uh, market um, they will go all right the lower your lbr is potentially the less your the lower your interest rate yep. could be yep. because i'll see the risk is lower like if for whatever reason things didn't work out um on the startup side you've got you've got 50 percent that's right you've got 50 percent equity in your house you're pretty you know low risk so i've got two more questions and then we're going to talk about the wonderful <laughs> world of tax structuring um one is very tactical one um again from mitch what happens um if you uh step off the board um is that does that make it easier i mean it's a big question for a founder to do that but does it make it easier um if you're not a director yeah. yes it would it would yeah and can you do that do that presumably for a year or so while you are going through a process and then step back on, right? It's yeah. not going to continue with fit. Yeah, also they're not going to are. check it. They're not going to check in with you again and, and sort of see where you're up to. I guess if it, lending is always based on that point in time. Yeah. From the character perspective, they are going to consider is this person a, um, you know, not somebody that we see being risky for us into the future. Um, but at that point in time, they're literally saying, what does where is this person at right now where is this borrower at right now? Oh, okay well that, there you go that might be an interesting tip and then lastly um i mean you sort of run a broker business within athena um you're obviously a great place to, to go where else what who are all the good brokers out there and how should people approach brokers generally yeah um <clears throat> look there are definitely specialists and i'm and i'm happy to sort of explore potential referral partners that we can find for anybody that is interested. You find like with brokers out there, um, there are specialists in different areas. So there'll be specialists um, in construction or there'll be specialists in, um, you know, trust setups or um, SNSF or whatever the case may be. There will absolutely be, there are specialist brokers in, say, mm. self-employed, but even in, in these sorts of self-employed sort of areas. Okay. That's um, cool. And so, yeah, I'm happy to sort of um, explore that for anybody that's interested. Um, I don't have a name to sort of throw at you right now, but I could, what, I could absolutely. What would you like to do? Because we actually that. got loads of recommendations, and thank yeah. you for everybody in the room who, who um, uh, pinged us on Twitter the other day when we were talking about this. We've got loads of recommendations that we got DM'd. Um, we'll pull that list together. Um, yeah. You know, I think the brokers would love the free advertising. So, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll yeah, get some of that as well. Yeah, happy to help with that. We'll send that round. Um, so, I thank you so much. That, that is absolutely well, brilliant. And, and I'm sure we'll get some other questions coming in, but I wanted to make sure we covered our, our other um, uh, brilliant guests here today as well. Um, we're going to we're gonna shift gears and, and welcome to everybody who's joined um, since we started. Um, we're talking about personal finance. We've just been talking about getting a mortgage for a founder, but we're going to shift gears now and talk about tax structuring, which is um, kind of, a, kind of a, a geeky topic, but a very important one and one, one I'm quite interested in myself. Um, we have a lot of our companies that um, ask us about how to get themselves set up, how to structure themselves so that they're um, uh, the most tax efficient vehicle for both their investors and themselves personally, and what they need to do at the very beginning of the journey to make sure they're not going to get stuck with some horrendous tax bill that they wouldn't have otherwise had to pay if and when they, they exit the business. So we've got Ryan Smith here, who's a partner at um, PwC, who does this sort of stuff day in, day out for um, his clients. Um, and I thought, Ryan, perhaps we could, we could start um, by talking us a little bit about sort of just general tax planning advice for founders who are at the beginnings of their journey and who might just be setting up their company or have recently started. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, and I won't be offended by the, the geeky comment. We get it all the time. So, <laughs> so some, of us some of us love 
this tech stuff. We're just we're just as geeky in the VC side, so don't worry about that. <laughs> True. All right. Um, oh, there's definitely a, a few things uh, things to consider, especially when when starting out. Um, planning is key. So so where pest, where possible, I definitely recommend. Uh, the entrepreneurial founders connecting in with a professional tax advisor. Um, again, it may just be an initial upfront meeting, um, which may not go anywhere, but at least gives the founders a bit of a background as to as to what to consider. Uh, you know, in, in our discussions we have with, with founders and entrepreneurs, you know, we're discussing potential future plans for around uh, funding, the, the different impacts of debt and equity funding, um, asset access to the ESIC concessions. So investors these days, the startups, you know, would, would love to be able to get those the early stage investment company concessions. So so structuring around that. Um, having discussions around likely profit timeline um, and impact on dividend flow and how, how that will flow out if, if, if it's applicable. Um, government incentives is a big one. So ensuring you're structured right to be able to access government incentives. Um, and then and then obviously, you know, the planning on what does it look like on a, on a possible exit. So again, early on, it might sound a bit overwhelming or a bit over the top when you're just starting out, but as your business grows and things progress, you know, you're going to end up with less time in the future to properly plan. So it's, it's best to get on top of this early um, because like you said, if you don't set it up properly early, um, yeah. whilst, we can, whilst we can assist, you know, in, um, in definitely improving the structure you know sometimes it, it can prove fatal is not necessarily the right word but you, you may be leaving some money for the tax man that you didn't have to <laughs> <laughs> not, not fatal but pretty bad well can you yeah. give us some some horror stories just to say you know just of, of things that weren't planned from the beginning and, and and that have maybe come back to bite founders when they when they exit or otherwise yeah yeah um so occasionally and, and i know we talked about i just Heard Sarah talk about family trusts, and James, you mentioned it, and they're very common um, uh, vehicles in Australia. Um, uh, yeah, a, a lot of people own their shares in the business through a family trust, but you know, I've seen stories, or we've seen cases whereby um, entrepreneurs and founders are actually operating their, ent- their operating company or operating business, sorry, through the family trust vehicle itself, as opposed to having the family trust own equity in in a, in a company that operates the company so well, what that means is a lot of the government incentives around um you know, talk about the you know S, getting investors in you know through the SC concessions or r d incentives they actually don't apply to trusts so you need to actually have a company structure to, to operate through and, and when you think about when you think about a trust um, mm. it, 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 it's it's a it's a separate legal entity from a tax perspective but you, you can't issue especially if it's a discretionary family trust which is very common you can't actually issue equity in that so when you yeah. have to go get outside investors in you know having that in a trust it just doesn't make sense um and, and it just can't work so in terms of it's hard to get um you know get e- extra capital in it, you know we, we can do some restructuring yeah. by putting it into a company but just up front we would, exactly. I don't what think we issue? would ever, I, I, I certainly don't think we're even allowed to invest in family trust. So no. I would echo that point. We would always make a um, make sure that there is a company structure around it. And, I, and yeah. I'd love to go on to family trusts in a minute because I must yeah. say that coming, I was away for a long, long time and had never really heard of family trusts until I came back to Australia and they seem to be everywhere. So I'd love to talk to you about yep. whether or not that's a good idea for founders. Um, uh, but, but, before that, um, if you're setting up your company to begin with, at what point do you have to start thinking about um, ESIC? Is that before you start, or can you do that later on? I uh, you can you can do it later on, so so long as you're starting with a, a company. So you, your business has to be a uh, be run through a company uh, for the ESIC concessions to apply. Um, so, so so that's the start with, and then then if you go the layer up, okay, who owns your company? So so quite often the most common thing is a founder will go out, incorporate a company, um, the founder themselves, um, whether it's, you know, with a friend, a, a spouse, whoever, or maybe they're by themselves, own the shares in that company. But that is where, um, you know, discussion around potentially having a family trust, owning the, sh- the shares in the, the underlying company comes into play and, and whether that's the most appropriate um, vehicle there. So from I, just touch on that, why, why would a founder, uh, what, what are the um, pros and cons of the founder owning a um, their shares in their company through a family trust rather than directly? Yep. So 
family trusts, which are a form of a, or it's basically a discretionary trust, i.e. no one has a fixed entitlement to the income or capital of, of the trust um, itself. Um, the two major reasons why people set up family trust to be shareholders. Uh, one, from an asset protection point of view. So um, if, if the shares in your startup are owned by a family trust, it's no longer considered an asset of yours or the founder personally. So that means if you were to get sued and get touch wood here and, you know, maybe it's limited circumstances where you may get sued, but it may be through, you know, breach of director's duties or just outside of the company itself. Um, I know you own, own, a, own a property or own, own something else and someone sues you. Again, it's probably, uh, you know, Australia, we're a bit lucky. We don't, it's not as litigious as the US, but just having, having that asset owned by a trust, which is a separate vehicle to you, um, is a good asset protection play. Mm. Um, yeah. And then and then secondly, the, the another key part is when, when your underlying business is generating, and again, I appreciate a lot of people on the on the call here maybe in sort of uh, tech tech based businesses whereby profits uh, and dividends may not be flowing anytime <laughs> soon. But obviously We do uh, believe in profits eventually. It's just not exactly. often that early days. <laughs> exactly. So so when an eventual profit is is being generated in the business um, ordinarily, if a, a founder is, is own, owns that um, business outright by themselves, as opposed to through a family trust, a dividend has to flow up to the to the shareholder, being the founder, and they can pay tax at up to forty seven percent. That's the top marginal rate in Australia. So, you know, if things are going well, dividends are flowing. It's coming up to you at forty seven percent. Whereas, if we have a family trust, a dividend gets paid up to the family trust, the shareholder, and the trustee of that trust, which is generally some generally. The, uh, the founder or a company controlled by the founder can determine where should we pay that dividend to or where should that di dividend get distributed. And that may be to a, you know, a, a non-working spouse. It may be to a, a, a separate company that you control, um, which um, is what we would refer to as a corporate beneficiary company, which isn't conducting a business itself, but we're taking profits out of the operating company and up to a trust and out to another company that you control that is not at risk. So it's just parking funds there. And the maximum tax rate there is 30% as right. opposed to 40, as opposed to 47% in your own name. And if it's a fully frank dividend, there's actually no, no um, further tax when the funds are left in that other company. And Ryan, does that same thing apply? So you just talked about dividends, but what if um, I sell part of the shares in my company or all of the shares in my company yep. and I own it through a family trust? Does the same thing apply then? Yeah, same, same thing applies. That the, a lot of people on the call will be familiar with um, what we refer to as the 50% capital gains tax discount. So if you own a own an, a, a capital gains tax asset like shares in a company for more than 12 months, um, if you um, sell and realise a gain after the 12-month period, um, you only pay tax on half the gain. Um, yeah. and that, that applies to a discretionary trust as well. So again, if you're owning it directly, you would still get that 50% CGT discount. But if you're owned by a trust, you may be able to spread that gain across yourself or, um, you know, a non-working spouse or you know, other beneficiaries that you may be supporting. Could um, you, can you, can you reinvest that money in the trust and, and, um, uh, and um, sort of immediately without having to pay um, the tax on it? No, sort of no, no, there, there is, there, there will be a need to, if there's a realisation event, especially cash realisation event, so Airtree, as an example, comes along and, and gives cash for some of the equity in the business, that will be taxable at that time. Um, again, at a maximum tax rate of 23.5%, being half the, the top marginal tax rate. So it's, it. it's not bad. Okay, then, so it, it gives you the ability to distribute more tax efficiently and just flexibility. Um, yeah, that's right. And, and then you might, like, you might look to put some of those proceeds back into the trust. You just gift it back into the trust, and that's when Kent's coming up later. Presto and the co and, and guys at, at um, and can can you know advise on how you invest that those funds in a passive nature if you don't want to go again in some sort of a business venture. So 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 oh, that's fantastic, Ryan. So I think there's a couple of things I've heard there is um is is one um uh, family trust structures can be useful. It gives you options to distribute returns a little bit more efficiently. Um, uh, two, um, make sure that you are running the company through a corporate structure rather than a, a family trust, which probably sounds obvious, but um, I imagine when people are just getting started out, it may not may be overlooked. Um, and three, uh, make sure you get some good advice early on. Um, just on that on that third one, Ryan, though, I mean, people um, uh, 
when they're first starting a company and they're um, scrimping and saving, they don't have a, a ton of money to go and um, instruct PwC for this. What, what, what do you, who do you advise? Is it just an accountant, that their local accountant can do this sort of advice? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I'll definitely reach out to. Obviously, uh, we can reach out to the uh, your, your networks. I know all the entrepreneurs and founders have a lot of uh, connections and, and different access to information these days. So, you know, you can have an initial discussion with them. But I, I do recommend speaking to a an expert, being maybe your your local accountant. But we at PwC actually work with a lot of smaller accounting firms just to give ad hoc advice. So we, um, as opposed to you know, dealing with you know basic tax returns and bases, we're actually educating the uh, smaller accountants around the um, different uh, ways to structure for, for, and different aspects. So again, again, rely on word of mouth to an extent, but it definitely comes with a word of warning because quite often you know business goals objectives are very different. You know, you, you might want to expand expand offshore, uh, which a number of people on the call will. Whereas if you're speaking to someone that's happy to stay locally. Um, you know, there may be different opportunities there to of, of what you need to do. And, and it is important, I don't want everyone to be anyone on the, on the call to be sort of scared that, oh, I don't have a family trust or I don't, I'm not operating through a company. There, there is an opportunity to, um, you know, move to those structures if you haven't already. You know, there are small business capital gains tax concessions out there already, um, which, you know, we advise heavily on if someone comes to us after they're already operating, yeah. whereby... You know, you can move structures quite tax effectively, um, especially utilising those concessions. But by and large, Ryan, it's easier to do when you're earlier on yeah. and you're not worth that much money than uh, when you're much later on and there's a big potential capital gains. Yeah, uh, with yeah that's when you're transferring. Yeah, that, that's right. That's right. And, and the other key thing is, uh, uh, like your business goals uh, and objectives, a, a structure can be fluid as well. So again, I talked on you know overseas expansion or, or taking mm. on a taking on a partner. It's not a set up a structure and set and forget. It, it is you do need regular checks in check ins, particularly if your um, you know your, your goals are, are changing or you know you're basically changing direction or um, yeah. So it is worthwhile just checking in as, as much as possible uh, with your your accountant um, just to yeah. to see how things are going. And then, and then um, two more questions, right? What, one um, when when companies are shaping up for an exit or an IPO, like the trade sale or an IPO. Um, for the lucky ones that, that get there, is there anything that they can do on the lead up to that to, to um, specifically set themselves up to optimise their tax situation? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's obviously an exciting time if you're approaching an exit, be it an IPO or, or a trade sale, but it, it, it's very important to be prepared as sooner rather than later. Um, Sarah talked about, you know, uh, being prepared for trying to get funding for home loans and so forth. It's the same for an, for an exit event. You, like, the sooner you, you're getting your ducks in a row, um, the better in terms of making sure your corporate corporate records are up to date, your, your tax lodgements are up to date. You know, I had talked about horror stories before, um, James, you asked, so I've been involved in a, with a number of businesses whereby um, whether it's a, a fund you know, entry coming along or a, 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 a trade sale coming along, and, and tax is a big um I suppose, scary point. If, if, if someone comes and looks at the business and their tax affairs aren't in order and their corporate records aren't in order, um, they'll either ask for a reduction in the, in the price, the purchase price, or they'll put a big warranty in, in there whereby you may have to park funds aside for a future potential ATO clawback. Um, so yeah. no one wants that. So yeah. it is important just to um, make sure your, your records are in order. And get that advice, which I think is the big takeaway that yeah. I've had from from this, Ryan. So, so chat to chat to your account, chat to PwC, chat to everybody yeah. you can yeah. around this. Um, uh, uh, thank you, Ryan. That's been fantastic. Um, uh, and, and it is geeky stuff, but it's so so <laughs> important. And I think if if ever if ever I've heard horror stories, they usually involve the ATO, and they usually involve not doing something that you should have in the early part of your journey. So yeah. it's, it's really important advice. Yeah. Um, for everybody who's joined, thank, thank you for joining. Um, um, we're, um, uh, we're talking personal finance for founders. Um, and we've just talked, um, we've just talked to um, uh, Ryan at PwC, Ryan Smith, about tax structuring. We've spoken to Sarah and Athena about how to get a mortgage. Um, and we're going to switch tax here and, um, and chat to um, Kent Heinmarsh, who's at Crestone Wealth Management, um, all about 
um, what to do um, uh, with with your money, really, um, and um, and how to think about um, alternatives to um, investments um, to diversify yourself, perhaps away from tech. If a lot of founders out there are highly, highly leveraged on our industry generally, both through their um, uh, their own companies and, and oftentimes in um, doing angel investors investments in our space as well. Um, but Kent's going to talk us through sort of how he thinks about. Um, wealth management and, and how to get started thinking about it um, long before um, you know you've got that big exit and you've got that big pile of money. Um, what to do in the lead up just to start um, preparing yourself and um, and investing the money that you do have. So thank you, Kent, and, and, and welcome. Thank you, James. So I guess we, we can a good place to start is is where do founders start? Um, you know, if 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 you're out there and, and you haven't yet had your big exit um, and you're uh, investing off the back of your cash flows, or maybe you've had some some money as a secondary along the way, but you're not yet at the point where you're going to Crestone and, and looking for um, all the wealth management advice that you might be able to give at, at, at the right point. Where, where would you start? Where do you suggest people start looking at for wealth well, advice? I think, you know, I, th I think to start with it, it helps just to practice as far as, you know, there's a lot of online accounts and there's a lot of platforms you can use where you can just build up experience without large sums of money. Just to get uh, to get used to things, and a lot of people will be trading stocks and things early on in their lives. If you're not doing that, I think um, you know financial planners are generally where people would start. And the reason for that is, uh, you know, wealth management. A lot of you know firms like ours, we only deal with what's called a wholesale investor or a sophisticated investor, which means you need to have a certain level of assets already. So a financial planner will tend to deal with retail investors and help just get started and help you get planning basically um similar to what the accounts and the pwcs the world do um but at a more i guess uh retail level so that's where i would certainly start um we are very happy to talk to founders or anyone quite early in the journey and just help them get educated because you, you also want to make sure that people don't find that they're caught up in a scam um there's certainly places you know you'd be seeing on the news at the moment Melissa Caddick, unfortunately, was a financial planner who um, looks like yes. today was found. But you know, oh, she was found. Where, where she was she found? Uh, on a beach. So <laughs> her, her foot was found, I should say. Oh, God. Um, yeah. So it's not a nice story. But the the point there is, there's there's also a lot of uh, people that you want to avoid in the in the game as well who um, can can scam you. So I'd be very careful, making sure you get good, you know. Reputable so firms you go to or good referrals, but trusted advisors, and and so of them, so you know, financial planner or wealth management advice or accountant. Like, where, where would you go first? Do you think if you're just at the beginning of your journey? Certainly, an accountant. Um, I think you know Ryan was talking about that. You need to make sure all your trust, uh, all your structures are set up correctly. Um, you know, we come in when we say, well, which entities would you like to invest in? Most of our clients invest in a number of different entities, but family trusts and super funds are the, are the most common because they tend to be the most tax effective. Um, but a financial planner, of course, because they can really start at the beginning and you know, plan what do your cash flows look like, help you, you know, if you do need a home loan, how do you plan for that? Mm. Um, I think the way to think about financial planners, and I'll be pretty general here, is uh, a lot of them are very good at the structuring side, but they their investments tend to be fairly generic. So mm. usually they're better at the, at the former. And if you've got um, substantial amounts of money in the end, you're probably better off to go to investment specialists. Yeah. And what, what about what about the very basics? Like people right at the beginning of the journey. I mean, we often talk about um, you know the cardinal rules. Make sure you're paying off your credit card debt first and your, your high interest products. Um, before you start to, um, and, and then have a cash buffer before you start to think about investment more generally? What are, what are some sort of tips early on? Early on, I guess, you know, when you speak to accounts, they'll always say pay off your house first because it's not deductible debt. Um, obviously, if you do that, you can draw off your, your house and use deductible debt to start investing. I think if you're going to be really sensible about it, you do a uh, you know, a, a monthly or quarterly investment plan where you don't have to pick market time or anything like that. And, you know, I don't want to you know, plug Spaceship necessarily, but I, I've, you know, had a look at Spaceship and the way they've set things up where you can just literally have a direct debit um, every month, 
very low levels as well is a pretty great way to gain uh, you know, early days in investing. And we're, we're obviously a bit conflicted there because we're invested in a spaceship, but I'm a customer there. It is pretty bloody awesome. Like it's a uh, very easy and very low fee um, option for um, for investing in a um, broad based effective ETF um, account. So I, I, I do recommend it even without being an investor. In it. But but that's it's a it's a it's a good point. Get this sort of. Um, you know, a lot of people on this room will be very used to doing things online and, and making sure that it's got um, nice self-serve packages. How does um, how should people think about robo advisors generally or self-serve wealth products? Well, I think you want to work out who's behind them first of all. So, you know, I think you know, knowing that an air tree is behind spaceship, for example, gives you a fair bit of comfort. Um, you know. Ugh. I think in general, the thing people need to be aware of is an advisor is often there to help you save yourself from yourself. So if you're on one of these platforms, you are going to be uh, up to the emotional roller coaster of whatever you're reading in the paper and you might make some silly decisions. So you need to just make sure you've got the right temperament to be able to go on and, and do it yourself. And if you can do it in a really structured manner and you've got a high quality robo advice um, you know, platform to go on, I think it's, it's a great way to start. And, that, and just, I just want to go back to the point you made a minute ago about accountants telling people to pay off their mortgage first. In a, in a world where we've got you know, zero percent um, interest rates in many parts of the world, and most people's mortgages are now starting with a two, in some cases a one, um, surely there's better advice on uh, places to park your money today. Well, I, I certainly agree with that myself, but it's I don't I don't want to tell everyone to go out there and borrow as much as you can and and have a crack um Again, we yeah. should trade that nothing <laughs> is financial advice uh, as always yeah uh, but but yes there's a lot of you know a lot of people are doing that at the moment just borrowing money at you know, sub two percent because you can put it in all sorts of places so i think the general way we think about where you can put it is obviously this stock market most of our you know we've got more money in offshore markets in australia just because we think there are better companies over there as you'd see the tech Best technology companies tend to be offshore um, and pharmaceutical, etc. But there's a, there's a whole, whole other world of, of assets out there, whether it's commercial real estate. Um, we have a huge interest in alternatives, which is private equity um, venture as well. And you have to take a much longer term view in, in those businesses, and it's a liquid and hard to get into if you're a retail investor. But yeah, you, you would hope that you could get more than two uh, percent in plenty of different places if you're taking a multi-year view. Uh, I have no idea what you'll make in the next three to six months on the stock market, for example. It's a bit up to the gods. Yeah, and, and, and can, on the uh, you, you work for a lot of um, high net worths who obviously have access to asset classes and, and, and investments that um, mere mortals on the street don't have. But any any tips for where? Um, well, where rich people are parking their money and um, and some suggestions on how others might be able to uh, take advantage of similar trends? Yeah, I, I think, you know, more and more we're seeing the wealthier people move into private markets, um, which has tended to, you know, basically that means a lot of markets where they're not, there's not a listed version. So Airtree is a perfect example. It's a private market, venture capitals in private markets, private equities in private markets. Um, and where this has come from, I think a lot of it is done, the industry super funds and pension funds have been investing this way for a long time and you need really patient capital because a lot of it is quite a liquid. Um, but the private equity and venture worlds, private equity, certainly the long-term returns have been better than listed equities, but you can't get access to your money for a long period of time and, and venture is even better, but you have to be in the top quartile or the, the top performing as a huge dispersion of returns in that. So for, for mere mortals, how do you get access to it? Um, for everyone day to day, I think the you know, reality is the industry super funds give you access. So someone like a host plus has been a huge supporter of um, particular venture in, in Australia. Um, so you can through your super funds get access to that stuff, but it is very tricky to do it any other way. And, and one of the reasons is, you know, for people, you know yourself, you can't invest in, Airtree, unless you're a wholesale sophisticated investor. So you already 
need to hit a certain or or if you or if your superannuation is with um uh what is a few of the big ones like aussie or or sun super that um are invested in us and i think that's that's a great point actually that more and more of the super funds are investing in our asset class which is giving people exposure to these so it's another way to do it It, exactly and and otherwise honestly it's it's really quite tricky and most if you go to a financial planner you just don't have access to those um places generally because because of the long lockups yeah um we've only got a couple of minutes left but i I want to um, uh, touch on um uh, a point that i think comes up a lot ken you must see this with some of your uh you do work with a lot of um tech entrepreneurs who um have taken some money out of the business or exited um a lot of people in our industry tend to be very much long our industry insofar as their founders and their, their wealth is tied up in their own companies um, and then oftentimes they're doing um, uh, their own personal account investing in, in tech stocks and, and some of those in tech startups as well. Do you find that a lot of people um, come to you and just haven't really thought through diversification um, uh, away from tech? To be honest, I've been surprised it's the opposite. Um, I think a lot of people who've made a lot of money in it appreciate that they are very overweight and you know we say always say that fortunes are made through the concentration of risk but you need diversification to maintain them and i think a lot of people realize that so they come to us and say you know i'm doing all the i'm taking risk here i've made my money can you make sure you diversify it um, into different asset classes so i'm not all exposed to one particular sector um and i'd say also you can put it into a couple of buckets where you've just got to work out how much money is in your absolutely don't lose bucket? How much is in just your normal investment bucket? And then how much is in your, I'm having a real crack here. Um, I might be investing in, you know, angel investing and that sort of stuff. Yeah. So, Sorry, go on. No, I was just gonna say, so, so I think generally founders come to us to maintain their wealth and grow it slowly rather than say, hey, I'm trying to double down here. Um, yeah, we, we, we have that topic come up a lot. We have, um, I'll give it a, a plug to our Explorer program here where we're, we're taking um, people and trying to um, uh, help them become angel investors um, with all the tools and the money and the um, and sort of the education that they need to, to do that. And a big part of that, certainly in the early couple of sessions, is talking about um, exactly that diversification and, and, and um uh, making sure there's sensible limits on how much you're willing to invest in other startups, because ultimately is a very, very high risk um, uh, initiative. Um, and uh, and so it's a big part of, of what we do there. But I, but I also wanted to just perhaps point out the, the fact, Ken, and, and, and thank you really, because um, everything that we do in terms of working with our startups and supporting them and, and giving them the money to grow their own businesses has to come from somewhere. Um, and it all does um, come from uh, upstream um, and our own investors, of which um, Crestone has been a huge supporter of us over the years. So it, it does come from the super funds. It comes from um, wealth managers. It comes from um, ex-entrepreneurs uh, that are all uh, investors in us. And, and, and hopefully we, we get to play an important role in um, uh, distributing that capital to where it's most needed, which is uh, founders with great ideas who are growing fast growing businesses. So so thank you, Kent, and thank you again for, for joining and, and chatting through this stuff. Yeah, uh, I'd say one more, one more thing, James, is just that I've noticed our particular clients love investing in the startup space because it not only you know has been luckily given very good returns, so thank you, Airtree, but they really do like supporting the community and um, watching young founders have success and watching you know new industries grow in Australia. So it's, it's not just about the money often, it's it's about investing in something that I really believe in. So uh, thank you as well. Uh, that's awesome. Um, well, well, on that on that very uplifting note, um, it's the top of the hour, so um, we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up here. But but I want to say a huge thank you for Kent, Sarah, and Ryan for joining us um, uh, and making what could have uh, been a fairly dry topic really pretty interesting. I learned a ton of stuff um, from this, and hopefully uh, the founders and, and others in the room did. I know there'll be plenty of questions. Please ping us on Twitter um uh or email um if you've got any further follow-up questions we'll do our best to, to answer them or, or farm them out to the, to the experts who can answer them better than we can um and there's probably a few bits and pieces we'll we'll do to follow up with this one of which is definitely a list of good uh, mortgage broker recommendations and there may be others as well 
Um, uh, Mel will have um, plans for our uh, next um, uh, uh, happy hour, Clubhouse happy hour. Um, the time might change. We did some uh, market research, as any great startup will do, and um, we got some suggestions on times that uh, people prefer. So we might shift uh, times, but we'll, we'll let you know, and we'll have some great topics coming up. So thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, have a great weekend, uh, and thanks for being here with us on uh, Startup Happy Hour. Bye-bye.